So happy Mother's Day, and Mother's Day seems to be quite an appropriate Sunday to celebrate and discuss the glory of the gender distinctions, roles, and responsibilities in the body of Christ. And based on the last two weeks, we've seen that the world is very confused about gender distinctions, and so it seems most appropriate to respond with the Word of God. Amen. Churches describe themselves as feminist. Churches describe themselves as egalitarian. Churches are chauvinistic. Churches are complementarian. So which is most biblical? See, it used to be you could just say, we believe the Bible, and that used to be enough. But in the world that we're living in today, everyone says they believe the Bible, and there's a tremendous amount of disagreement in this area. So it seems most appropriate to define it, quantify it, and communicate it, and that's what we're going to do today. So our title, Complementarianism, A Biblical and Balanced Gender Distinctions and Roles. Balanced biblical and balanced gender distinctions and roles. Genesis chapter number 1, please. And let's stand for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> there, there is no more important verse in the entire Bible... Than Genesis 1 1. There is no more important verse in the entire Bible than Genesis 1 1. Right. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Look, folks, if that's not true, then there's no reason for us to be here. Everything that we're going to talk about this morning is built on that foundation. If Genesis 1-1 is not true, then you can have your opinion as much as I can have my opinion. And we can just agree to disagree. But if there is a God who created everything, then we need to get in line. That's the essence of it. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now we have seen foolish behavior beyond measure. And it's all predicated upon the belief that there is no God. It's really that simple. If you think that that's too simple then you don't understand the foundation of the entire Word of God. It's all there. Rusty, it's good to have you back. Praise the Lord for being with us. And God said in verse 26, Let us, referencing the Trinitarian Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, make man, humanity, in our plural possessive pronoun image after our plural, possessive pronoun, likeness, and let them, referencing humanity, have dominion over all the earth and of the sea and over all the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over the creeping thing that it creepeth upon the earth. So God created man, humanity, in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female, created he, them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Let's pray. Father, your word is quicker, powerful, sharper, you have promised in Isaiah 55 that it will not return void. That it goes forth from this premise over the power of the internet into the hearts and minds of thousands of people. I pray, dear God, that the world would be instructed this morning 
concerning the gender distinctions that are God ordained and are exceptionally God glorifying. I pray, dear God, that the young people would be instructed and would listen attentively and would be educated and would grow in their ability to give an answer for the hope that lies within them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the spirit of giving credit where credit's due and honor where honor's due. Where is Mr. Finley at from Liberty? Where are you sitting? Young man, you did an exceptionally good job on that YouTube video that you posted. Thank you so much. If you haven't watched it, go online and see for it yourself. Um, excellent job. Very well done. Thank you so much. Our focus is on the family and church this morning. Our focus is not on business. Our focus is not on sports. Our focus is not on government. And the reason our focus is on the church and the family is because that's where the Word of God gets into gender distinctions. The Word of God, quite frankly, has very, very, very little to say about gender distinctions in business and gender distinctions in government and gender distinctions in sports. But it has an amazing amount of information to speak to us about gender distinctions in the family and gender distinctions in the church. And so that's our focus this morning. Nothing in the Bible, and I say this as strongly as I can, as deliberately as I can, nothing in the Bible should be thought or perceived to teach that men are superior to women. Both are made in the image of God. For us to conclude, or for anyone to conclude looking at the outside, that that's some cultic church that's got their women locked up in closets is absurd. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. It is so off base, it's unbelievable. It is so unbiblical, it's unbelievable. So let's look at verse 27. So God created man, humanity in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Christian homes and churches must celebrate, rejoice in, and affirm the complementary differences between men and women. I mean, we, we don't suppress that. We elevate it. We, we don't ignore it. We're thankful for it. I wouldn't want to go to a church with nothing but men in it. Nor should you want to go to a church with nothing but women in it. We are grateful that God, in His infinite wisdom, created He, them, male and female. In the Godhead, each person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is equal in deity and worth and importance, but not roles and functions. The Father doesn't have the role that the Son has. The Son does not have the role that the Father had. The Father did not die on the cross the way the Son died on the cross. They are equal in authority, equal in, I mean, equal in importance, equal in deity, equal in worth, equal in omniscience and equal in omnipotence, but they are not the same in their roles and functions. What I would suggest to you is that in creation, each human, male and female, is equal in dignity, worth, and importance, but not roles and functions. Not roles and functions. Equal, again, let's stress it so that there's no question, equal in dignity, equal in worth, equal in importance, but different in roles and functions. So this idea of complementary comes from serving to fill out or complete, mutually supplying each other's lack. That when a husband and a wife are joined together in holy matrimony, they make up for each other. They complement each other. They become stronger. They become one flesh and they make up for each other's inadequacies such that they are better married than apart. That's the idea. That's biblical. So the human creation is made in the image of God. All right, pastor, how do we show forth that image of God? Is it because I have hands and God has hands? No. Is it because I have a mind and God has a mind? And that, well, let's talk about that. These ideas right here are clearly the primary way we show forth the image of God. Number one, and there's harmonious interpersonal relationships. 
Number two, in our equity and equality in personhood. And number three, in our differences in roles and authority. So let's talk about it. Number one, therefore shall a man leave his father and a mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. When a husband and wife are married and they are living together well and they're not fussing and they're not fighting and they're not in a tailspin, when they know each other, when they love each other, when they can think each other's thoughts, when they can help fulfill each other's sentences. I mean, when that marriage is just running well. That's a beautiful picture of the Trinity. There's a glorious picture of the Godhead. Do you understand that there's no competition in the Godhead? You understand there's no friction in the Godhead. There's no jealousy in the Godhead. The, the son is not upset that the father's in charge. The Holy Spirit's not confident in attitude because he's got to point people to Jesus. I'm tired of pointing to people to Jesus. One more person I got to point to Jesus. No, it's not that at all. They love the fact their roles. And so the interpersonal relationship within the Trinity is seen in the way husbands and wives love each other, model of that. Number two, the wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. So we want to say right away, perfect equality in marriage. Perfect equality in marriage. We are not suppressing women and elevating men this morning. That's not what we're doing. Number three, Paul says, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. There is authority figures in life. There are authority figures in life. We all have an authority figure to answer to. So when we talk about complementarianism and churches that embrace complementarianism, please understand that every church plots different on a continuum. And I want to be very clear here. There are some family integrated churches, FIC churches. I don't want to paint with a broad brush such that I get a bunch of emails. But there are some family integrated churches that are over the top on this stuff. And they're so far over here that you'll hear a wife on YouTube talking about, uh, Pastor, do I have to ask permission to leave the room for my husband? Okay. All right. That's not complementarianism. That's sick. Okay. That's not complementarianism. That's sick. Now remember, when you say the word, Dan, complementarianism, everyone doesn't automatically understand what you mean. That churches plot along this line differently when we're talking about how do men and women complement each other in the roles that God has ordained? How do they complement each other? Every church is different. And so you don't just make a broad brush analysis. You have to ask questions. On the other end, Art, would you please go back? So on this end over here is uh, too extreme. On this end, notice I'm off the chart. I'm off the PowerPoint slide. On this end is a whole other problem. Let me show it to you. There are churches that take this verse, Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither is male or female, and they've determined that there are no gender distinctions. No gender distinctions. Well, what do you mean? How does this work out? What would this look like? Well, let me show you. Notice I've taken the name of the church off. If you want to know what church this is, see me afterwards, and I'll tell you when I'm off the camera. X Memorial Church, X Memorial Church for today, actual church, serves as a sanctuary for progressive activism, artistic expression, spiritual nature. We welcome persons of all sexual orientations and genders, that is, cisgender, transgender, and genderqueer. Let's keep on. This is a church. To participate fully in the life and ministry of the church. We fully support each and every quest to construct one's own identity. Affirming any and all who identify as lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer. Questioning poly, a, pan, omni. Or of that boring straight category. Now, now please understand something. Please. No church married a becomes like this overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. Okay? This church was a fundamental Baptist church. And then you go like this. A couple years go by, you go like this. A few
few years go by, you go like this. 20 years go by, you get a new leadership, you go up here, and next thing you know, you're so far out the chart, Steve, that you can't move. Now, how does this happen? It's a slow, gradual departure from the Word of God. A slow, gradual departure from the Word of God. Sermons are less filled with the Word of God and more filled with social justice, activism, things that don't relate to the Word of God. The Word of God that once had a prominent position is a less and less of a position to the point where this church serves as a sanctuary for progressive activism, artistic expression, and spiritual nurturing. All right. I thought we were here to worship the King of Kings, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and disciple believers. If I look at this, I think theater. I think theater. I don't think church. So, Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate. On this Mother's Day, we are here to worship God for His decision that it was not good that we were alone. Thank you, Lord, for recognizing that we needed a helpmate. When God said it is not good that man be alone, Adam was not alone. Adam had God. He had God. And even having God, even having God, God said, you need somebody else. You are a mess by yourself. <laughs> you need somebody else. So, Proverbs 31 is the answer to this. Please turn to Proverbs 31. It's the answer to you need somebody else. Proverbs 31. Most of the time on Mother's Day you jump right into verse 10. We are not going to do that. We want to look at verse number one. <clears throat> in chapter number 31, we have a record of instruction that King Lemuel received from his mother. That's what we have. The words of King Lemuel, the oracle or the prophecy or the instruction that his mother taught him. Now, oftentimes we think that perhaps this instruction stopped at verse 9, but there's nothing in the text that should give us any indication that mom stopped instructing until the end of the chapter, verse number 31. From verse 1 to verse 31, there's nothing that gives us any indication within the context that mom is still not teaching her boy. Oh, oh, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son? What, my son of my womb? What, my son of my vows? My son? My son that I carried for nine months in my womb. My son that I had because I was married. Listen up, son. I need to teach you something. So right now, right away, right in the beginning of the service, we want to affirm that moms are great teachers. Amen. We want to affirm moms keep teaching. Moms, we need you to teach. Moms, we need you to follow this example. Moms, 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 teach, teach, teach. Complementarianism recognizes and appreciates the huge contribution mothers can bring to society as the only gender that can repopulate the world. Complementarianism recognizes that it was God who promised to a woman that she would bring forth the seed that would destroy the serpent and bring forth the good news. So there's nothing in a church that has a complementarian understanding that suppresses women. It's just the opposite. It recognizes the glory of the creation of God in you. So now let's look at verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Give not thy strength unto a woman, nor thy ways to that which destroys the kings. 
Hey, this is a mom who's crazy about her boy. This is a mom who says, you're going to get married someday. You're going to grow up. You're going to be in charge of something. And right now, as a young boy, as a young man, I need to start teaching you some stuff. You need to learn from me. I want to impart to you some wisdom. So number one, watch out for women. Watch out for those women in Proverbs chapter number 6 that lay in the weight. And they want to capture your soul. They want to entice you with their bodies. Watch out for those women, son. Pay attention to those women. Stay away from them. He, she continues, Oh, Lemuel, it is not good for kings to drink wine, nor princes strong drink. Watch out for alcohol, boy. It'll tear your life up. Watch out for alcohol. Everybody's going to entice you to have a drink. Be careful. It'll tear you up. She continues, Lest you forget the law. How many times you've heard someone doing something really stupid when they were drunk? Why? Why? Because we lose our, yeah, our judgment. We lose our judgment. So she's giving her son some wise instruction. What's wrong with drinking, mom? I'll tell you what's wrong with drinking, boy. You're going to get yourself in a mess sometime if you get drunk. Be careful there. They forget the law. They pervert the judgment of the afflicted. Give strong drink only to those that are perishing. Give wine to those that are of a heavy heart. Let him to drink and forget his poverty. Not you, boy. Remember your misery no more. Open thy mouth to the dumb in the cause of all that are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth. Judge righteously. Plead the cause for the poor and the needy. There's mom. Be compassionate, boy. Be compassionate, son. Don't allow yourself to be elevated to the point where you lose compassion on those that are less than you. Are you doing this, moms? Are you teaching your boys, moms? Do you understand that you have a special relationship with your son that the father does not? Do you understand, moms, that your son will hear stuff from you that they won't hear from the father? That's why you're there. God gave you a responsibility to teach your boy stuff that they won't hear from the father. And you impart to them special words of wisdom. Are you reading the word of God to your children? Do they hear you reading scripture to them? Are you instructing them, moms? Proverbs 31 reminds me of Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Yes, yes, we're going to do that thing of teaching our children about God. We are not going to allow them to make up their own minds at four years old. We are going to teach them about God at a very early age. We're not going to teach them to become questioning. We're going to teach them to believe what they're taught. At the T4G conference, John Piper was asked the question as to why he believes the Word of God is the Word of God. Why he believes that it's the inspired, infallible Word of God. And here was his response. Because my mama told me it was. That's a great foundational answer right there. That's the kind of answer that you can grow on top of, that you can build on top of, that you can teach. But that's a great foundational answer right there. Let's continue. And these are the words which I command thee this day that shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in the way, when thou walkest in the way, and when thou liest down. When you pick them up for soccer practice, when you drop them off for soccer practice, when you pick them up from the movies, when you take them to the movies, what are you doing, moms? Teaching, 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 teaching. Don't think in terms of just five minutes of family worship. Think in terms of instructing all day long. A news clip's on the television. Stop that thing and talk about it. You go see the movie Avengers. Stop and talk about it afterwards. What did you see in that movie? What was reflective of a biblical worldview? What was not? What can we learn from it? What shouldn't we learn from it? That's instruction all the time. What kind of woman can do this? You can. You can, ladies. You can. In fact, if we recognize it, Titus 2 tells us that you ladies have a major role to be mentoring all the time in the body of Christ. It starts off like this. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become with holiness, not false accusers, not given to too much wine, teachers of good things. You say, Pastor, how do I know if I'm an aged woman? I'm going I'm to let you know right now if you're an aged woman. If you have more years as an adult than a child, you've crossed the line. Okay? If you have more years as an adult than a child, you're old. Okay? Just, just join the crowd. 
I know that hurts feelings and everything, and there's no kind way of saying it. Okay? What, what am I supposed to do with this? Teach. Teach. Who? Me. Teach. You are to teach. Let's look at the Word of God. They become teachers of good things that they may teach the young woman, teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, to be chaste, to be keepers at home, to be good, to be obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Amen. Titus 2. Titus 2. We need more Titus 2 women in the church. Amen. You're in nursery. Turn it into a Titus 2 me meeting. You're, you're at a, a, at a um, Sunday night event, snack activity. Turn it into a Titus 2 event. You're down at Anchorage for a ladies retreat. Turn it into a Titus 2 event. You're on Facebook and you're interacting with somebody. Turn it into a Titus 2 event. Turn it into a Titus 2 event. God has given you ladies an amazing degree of wisdom. Use it and impart it into the body of Christ. So then in verse number 10, he, she begins to give him some instructions as to how to find a wife. What should I find in a wife? Now think about this. If determining to follow Jesus Christ is the first and the most important decision of life, most of us in this room would agree that choosing who you're going to spend an eternity with, or a lifetime with in marriage would be the second most important decision. Right? Yes or no? So this mom knows that her boy is going to grow up to get married. So she starts imparting into him wisdom as to what kind of a woman he should marry. Hey, son, look for this in a wife. Look for this in a wife. Stay away from those kind of girls. Look for this kind of a woman. Son, you're going to be married to her for your entire life. Look for this. So let's get started. Who can find a precious woman? Complementarianism recognizes that an excellent wife is a gift from God. Proverbs 19, 14 says, And a prudent wife is from the Lord. In egalitarianism, it's different. In feminism, this is actually a suggestion that being a gift from a God is a male chauvinistic idea. That's how backwards the world is. The Word of God communicates a prudent wife as a gift from God, and the world says that that's chauvinistic. In egalitarianism, the husband would be as much a gift from God to the wife as the wife is a gift from God. The problem with that is that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't ever say, I'm a gift to my wife. If she chooses to see me as a gift, that's her decision. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that wives are a gift to husbands. It doesn't say spouses are gifts to spouses. Now that's the gender distinction that the world wants you to eliminate. That's the goal of the world. Eliminate gender distinctions so that a spouse is a gift to a spouse. All right, hold on. I'm not doing a good job teaching this, so let me back up. This church starts right here in the 1800s as a fundamental Baptist church in which the pastor is a male and they believe in gender distinctions. And the first thing they do is they eliminate gender distinctions so that the spouse is a gift to a spouse, so the husband is a gift to the wife, and the wife is a gift to a husband. But wait a minute, they don't stop there. See, when you depart from that, and you begin this slide this way, the next thing is, a dude is a gift to a dude, as much as a dude is a gift to a dude. That's what happens. First, it is Proverbs 19.14. Men, if you receive a virtuous wife, that is a gift from God. Then it is, that's chauvinistic. A wife is a gift to a God as much as a husband is a gift to a wife. It's equal. Don't elevate one above the other. It's equal. Well, then the next step after that is, well, why does it have to be a wife to a husband, a husband to a wife? Why can't it just be a partner to a partner and a partner to a partner? It doesn't start off like that. That's why this is important. In complementarianism, the church recognizes that the Bible sometimes says one thing about a gender that it doesn't say about another. And let me show you what I mean. Pastor Dwayne preached on this Sunday, Wednesday at the chapel. 
Please look at this verse. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And again, women would take offense to that. Don't you call me a weaker vessel? That's the chauvinistic world that we're living in. That's the feministic world that we're living in. I want to show you the gender distinction here. And being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Whose prayers are hindered in this verse? Spouse or husband? The husband. The husband. There's nothing in the Word of God that says that your prayers will be hindered or your prayers will be hindered or your prayers will be hindered. There is something in the Word of God that says that, Sean Harris, you fail to honor your wife the way you are commanded to honor her. Stop praying. Why? Your prayers are hindered. Your prayers are hindered. Why? Because I told you to give honor unto your wife. Now we have two choices here. We can leave the gender distinctions in the verse... Or we can just say that what Peter really meant was the spouse that doesn't honor the spouse has their prayers hindered. Once you go down that slippery road, church, where does it stop? In egalitarianism, the philosophy is that a person can be just as happy with the person in the same sex as the opposite sex or the transgender person because all sexes are equal in roles and functions. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. I would tell you that complementarianism is built on trust. Trust that the whole Bible is the word of God. Trust that God knows best. Trust that he doesn't make mistakes. Trust that I will find my greatest joy in living out the gender identity God made me with. Trust that gender confusion and conflict is a result of sin. Trust that the gospel is the power of God to save me from gender confusion and conflict. Hey, let's be clear. We are not saying that there isn't gender confusion in the world. There is. We're not saying that there isn't gender conflict in the world. There is. All you got to do is get two husbands and wives, put them in the same house for the first six months of marriage, and you're going to see conflict. Okay, what's the matter with the rest of y'all? Do you not remember your first six months of marriage? A bliss. Uh, <laughs> Revelation 21 8, all liars will have their part in a lake of fire which burns forever and ever. <laughs> hey, folks, listen. Putting a husband and wife in the same house together is hard. What's the solution? The gospel. We're not saying that there isn't gender confusion in the world, we're not saying that people don't have struggles in these areas. They do. We're saying that the Word of God has the solution. So he says, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he will have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Find a wife that will do you good. Find a wife that makes a difference in your life. The, the uh, paraphrase of this, verse number 11 says, Her husband can trust in her, and she will greatly enrich his life. Right here. Greatly enrich his life. All you got to do is look at what happens when a guy gets married. All of a sudden his clothes start to match. I mean, I mean this guy couldn't pick out clothes to save his life. He, his, his pad is a wreck. And she brings to his house an element of difference. Where's that coming from? Where is that coming from? The complementary roles that husbands and wives have. Next slide. She works willingly with flax and works willingly with her hands. Next. Complementarianism recognizes and exalts women as capable, intelligent, industrious, hardworking, valuable members of all aspects of society. She is, like, she is like the merchant ship. She brings forth her fruit from afar. She rises while it's yet night. She gives portions to her household, instructions to her maidens. She considers the field and buys it. If some of you husbands out there have got your wife so suppressed that she can't even make a decision without your permission, you are wrong. You are wrong. In Proverbs 31, this woman considers the field, buys it, plants it, and makes a profit, and you don't even know what's going on. Why? She's an intelligent, wise, capable, industrious woman. 
So the king is saying, find yourself a wife like that. Find yourself a wife like that. Nothing about complementarianism keeps women out of industry or business. And I say by extension, sports with a few caveats. Ladies, I don't think that you should be in a sport in which you beat each other's brains out. I, I, I just don't. I think that there needs to be a degree to which the sport you're participating in still allows you to maintain some gender identity. So all kinds of basketball and soccer and softball and all those wonderful things are all fine. No one's saying something that, that the Word of God doesn't say. As long as you can maintain your gender identity, maintain it. She girds her loins with strength, strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. Her candle does not go out by night, so she stays up late, planning, working. She lays her hands to the spindle. She takes hold of his distaff. We don't understand this because we don't make fabric today. But this is a wise woman. She has children. She anticipates the needs of the children. You're out in July. She's buying a winter coat. And you're like, what are you buying a coat for right now? Well, because I know that they're going to outgrow it. And it's on sale right now. And this is a good time. And the guy, man, he would never buy a coat in the middle of the winter. You don't need coats in the winter. When do we even need a coat? When it's cold out. Then that's when you go looking for a coat. This woman, she's looking forward. She's anticipating the needs of her family. She's buying things on sale. She's alert. She's a, just wonderful. She stretches out her hand to the poor. She reaches forth her hands to the needy. She's got compassion to the less fortunate in the congregation and models that for the church. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. is well clothed. She's prepared for the winter. She's looking forward in life. Hey, church, this is a wife that's loyal, hardworking, capable, prudent, frugal, physically fit, and compassionate. There's nothing about complementarianism that doesn't lift up the female gender as an incredible contribution to life. She makes her covering of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. She looks like a woman. It's a beautiful thing. We, we like this. Paul says that you guys can take that to the extreme. So he gives a word of caution in the other direction. That women need to adorn themselves with respectable apparel. With modesty. With self-control. Be careful about how much braiding you do. And how much gold you wear. You're not supposed to walk into the sanctuary. And everyone turns the head at you. But you're not supposed to wear a burqa either. You're supposed to be beautiful. You're supposed to be beautiful. That's the way God made you. It's a good thing for a woman to look like a woman. Stand in front of the mirror and say, God, is this honoring? Is this God glorifying? Am I following the mandates of Scripture? Holy Spirit, convict me if there's anything about what I'm wearing that I shouldn't. I want to love you, Lord Jesus. I want to glorify you with my body. Her husband is known in the gates. So, so let's, let's be clear here. Teenagers, boys, young men, college students, this woman doesn't marry a stupid bum. Amen. Okay? And that's the word I meant. That wasn't a mistake. S-T-U-P-I-D. Okay? She doesn't marry a loser. There are no losers. I don't know about that. What, what, are, you, what are you trying to say here, Pastor? If you want a wife like this, be this man that is known in the gates. Be this man that's known in the gates. It, it is amazing how 21-year-olds are still acting like boys. Still acting like boys. 30-year-olds still acting like boys. This beautiful Proverbs 31 woman is not going to marry a boy. She's not going to marry a boy. It's not happening. It's not. Some of you need to grow up. You can't even have an intelligent conversation with you unless it revolves around something stupid. It's time to grow up. It's, look, look, her husband is known in the gates. We've been exalting this wonderful woman that's wise and intelligent and capable and all that. And she doesn't marry a bum. 
She doesn't. She makes fine linen and sells it. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. With wisdom. Guys, men of the church, please listen to me. Some of you are neglecting your greatest asset. Your wife is wise. If you don't consult your wife when you're making decisions, you're stupid. You're stupid. God gave you a wife to be a helpmate. Some of you are making decisions about buying major purchases and all kinds of stuff and you're not consulting your wives. That is a mistake. That is a mi But I'm the head of the house. No wife wants to submit to a knucklehead. <laughs> you make it difficult to submit. You, 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 you are making this whole marriage relationship more difficult than it needs to be. Ask. Honey, what do you think we should do about that? Listen to her. And then in the end, if there's a conflict, go pray about it. If you don't have to make the decision right away, give yourself seven days. We're, we're going to wait seven days. We're going to pray about it. We're going to pray about it. We're going to come back together. In the end, if a decision has to be made and you have no, no resolution, then men, you're going to have to make the decision. And wives, you're going to have to trust the Lord. But you do that after you've prayed about it, after you've discussed it, after you've come together, after you've separated from more prayer, come together, and then sometimes you'll have to make a decision. Complementarianism recognizes women as intelligent and wise with so much to contribute to their husband, their children, the church, and society. These women do, do not have to fight for the right to be heard. We have weekly staff meetings in the church, and in the weekly staff meetings, the ladies that are in the church staff are all in there. And we routinely say, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Because they bring into the discussion an entire perspective that we may have completely neglected. Amen. She looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. This woman is not lazy. She's a hard working. The son's wife must embrace her role in the household. This does not mean she can't have help. But she's got to embrace her role. And this woman in Proverbs 31, she's got outside help coming in to help her. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. In complementarianism, the husband affirms the unique role of the wife and brings to his life and praises her. Final instructions. Son, son, I, I, know, I know right now, at 17 years old, all you can think about is outward beauty. At 21, all you can think about is outward beauty. But son, please recognize, outward beauty is deceitful and fleeting. That's what she says to him. Make sure your wife fears the Lord. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excel them all. Favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain or empty. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So in complementarianism, four comments, we're done. The truth of God's word is most adhered to. Number two, women are valued as critically important members of the family, church, and society. Number three, husband and wives live out the beauty and the mystery of the Trinity in the relationship of quality and distinctions and roles and functions. And number four, males lead with Christ as their example. Let's pray.